Hi, I'm Dr. Raul Ruiz Esponda and I'm part of the Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism Division here at Mayo Clinic. I'm going to talk about a very important subject which is uh, celiac disease and bone health. There's evidence that suggests that most patients with celiac disease go undiagnosed and not everyone has the typical symptoms, the typical gastrointestinal symptoms of celiac disease. So those patients that don't have the diagnosis and those that have the typical symptoms may also have the extraintestinal symptoms uh, of celiac disease and these include anemia, infertility, delayed puberty and bone loss. Bone loss is important because it may lead to osteoporosis and fractures and we know that fractures may sometimes carry morbidity and sometimes even mortality. So it is very important to detect that and make sure that celiac disease patients have their bone health needs taken care of. There are several reasons why someone with celiac disease uh, may have bone loss. This includes malabsorption, uh, inflammation itself, and also some other less explored etiologies. The immune-mediated enterocyte destruction leads to epithelial atrophy at the intestinal level. That leads to malabsorption primarily of calcium and vitamin D, which are very important for bone health. Some studies have also shown alterations in the calcium transport mechanism, specifically vitamin D-dependent uh, receptors at the enterocyte level. Sometimes these are uh, decreased in numbers in patients with celiac, celiac disease. And all of this leads to malabsorption of calcium and vitamin D. Malabsorption of calcium is important in this case because that leads to what we call secondary hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid hormone is secreted by the parathyroid glands which are in the neck area and they uh, play a very important role in regulating calcium levels in the blood. When calcium levels are detected to be low in the blood, parathyroid hormone is secreted. That leads to the conversion of 25 hydroxyvitamin D into 125 uh, dihydroxyvitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D. This is done in the kidneys. That leads to increased calcium absorption in the gut and also uh, calcium reabsorption in the kidneys. However, in situations like uh, celiac disease when malabsorption is occurring in, at the intestinal level, then parathyroid hormone plays uh, an important role in bone resorption in order to get some calcium from there in order to keep the levels within normal limits and that leads to decreased uh, bone density or uh, bone wasting. So that's how malabsorption leads to secondary hyperparathyroidism that leads to bone loss. So some studies have shown that in patients with celiac disease, the higher the level of PTH, parathyroid hormone, the lower the bone density at the hip and the spine. Um, and that correlation kind of explains or ties, ties this together as, as being an, uh, one of the mechanisms how you lose bone when you have celiac disease. Another, Another important mechanism is inflammation. Uh, celiac disease being an inflammatory problem itself leads to the production of cytokines which activate osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are the cells that are responsible for bone resorption. Other less well understood mechanisms include the fact that most celiac disease patients tend to have lower levels of activity or physical activity. They tend to have lower uh, BMIs or body mass index. They tend to have early menopause and there are some studies that suggest that they have decreased levels of growth hormone and perhaps peripheral resistance to testosterone. All of these are considered factors for bone loss. We use bone density as a surrogate marker for the risk of fractures. The studies that have compared patients with celiac disease and healthy controls have shown that patients with celiac disease at diagnosis tend to have lower bone densities both at the hip and at the spine. Similar studies have also shown that the degree of uh, low bone density correlates with the degree of damage at the gastrointestinal level, meaning that the more malabsorption, the lower the bone density um, is. Now if you pull these studies together, you will find that anywhere between 50 to 70 percent of patients with celiac disease will have some degree of low bone density. However, the most important clinical outcome is fractures. The studies that looked into this have shown that patients with celiac disease are at 30 percent higher likelihood of having a fracture compared to someone who does not have celiac disease. 
it is important to mention that a lot of this data comes from smaller studies with a lot of uh, population heterogeneity. However, uh, we know for a fact that patients with celiac disease will have lower bone densities and higher risk for fractures. So what can we do about this? If you follow someone with a new diagnosis of celiac disease and you start treatment, which is a gluten-free diet, and you follow their bone density for up to a year, you will see that they will typically uh, gain about an 8% of their bone mass back just with following a gluten-free diet. The studies that have followed patients like this for longer periods, up to five years, there seems to be that that gain kind of stabilizes and not much uh, more is gained after that first year. So what we typically do is we do a bone density when we diagnose them. We do one uh, a year after being on a gluten-free diet and it's until then, uh, if needed, that's when we consider doing medications for osteoporosis, such as anti-resorptive therapy. As endocrinologists, it is very important to evaluate how the calcium homeostasis parameters are upon diagnosis. So it's not only about measuring a vitamin D level, which is very important and needs to be corrected if it's low, but also getting a sense of that degree of secondary hyperparathyroidism. And what we do is we usually measure a calcium level, a phosphorus, a parathyroid hormone level, the measurement of the 24-hour urinary calcium excretion, and of course the total vitamin D level in order to get a sense of how things are. We focus on repleting the vitamin D levels if deficient before we start thinking of any other types of medication. Some of the most commonly used medications for osteoporosis are bisphosphonates. Now, one should be cautious when using these medications with someone with celiac disease as they may have lower vitamin D levels and when used uh, in someone with low vitamin D levels, one can run the risk of developing low calcium levels which can be very serious and problematic. No large randomized controlled trials have been done to assess exactly how much calcium and vitamin D supplements should someone with celiac disease have every day. However, it varies a lot between patient to patient because of the different degrees of malabsorption. We do, however, consider them high risk for osteoporosis, so we recommend at least 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium and 1,000 international units of vitamin D. Ideally, this should be obtained through the diet. However, in this particular case, supplements are typically used. Most of the supplements that are commercially available are gluten-free and can be used uh, in these uh, cases. No large studies have looked into which are the safest or best medications to use when dealing with osteoporosis in patients with celiac disease. However, we know that it's extremely important to make sure that the secondary hyperparathyroidism has uh, been addressed and their vitamin D levels have been repleted prior to considering these medications. And again, we typically allow one year of gluten-free diet before we start thinking about trying uh, medications for this. Thank you very much.